Our scripture reading today, in preparation for the monologue and the message, is from Mark chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. He left that place and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. On the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astounded. They said, where did this man get all this? What is this wisdom that has been given to him? What deeds of power are being done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James and Joses and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, prophets are not without honor, except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. And he could do no deed of power there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and cured them. And he was amazed at their unbelief. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. I am Jesus's younger sister, Anne. I was named for our maternal grandmother. My sister and I and my four other brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, are mentioned several times in the New Testament, but not much is known about us. As you might guess, my siblings and I dearly loved our wonderful oldest brother, Jesus. Although my other brothers waited until after Jesus' ascension to heaven to become his disciples, my sister and I eagerly became two of his first followers, along with our beloved mother, Mary. So, of course, we were there for Jesus' last Passover, that special meal that would become known as the Last Supper and commemorated for 2,000 years by Christians. You may have heard stories of my mother, Mary, and her sister, Salome, my aunt. Yes, They were blessed sisters because of how they were related to Jesus. But I too was a blessed sister because I was one of Jesus' younger sisters. It was so awesome to grow up with him as my older brother. Perhaps you have heard that some biblical scholars think my siblings and I were really Jesus' cousins or Joseph's children by another wife. But if that were so, why didn't the Gospels call us his cousins or tell about Joseph's other wife? And why were my brothers repeatedly named in the New Testament and called Jesus' brothers, even by the townspeople of Nazareth? Whatever the case, I'm eager to share with you a bit what it was like to be Jesus' sister. Do you have a brother that can fix anything? My brother Jesus could. He could even fix things and animals and people that nobody else could. How do you suppose our mother Mary knew he could turn water into wine at the wedding in Cana? We, his family, had already experienced many times his special powers from Yahweh. He could perform miracles like the prophets in our Torah, but he always told us not to tell anyone. When I was little in the evenings, Jesus used to lift me to his lap and tell me stories about how much Yahweh loved me. Of course, the children and teenagers gathered around us as we sat on the stone bench in the cool shade of the olive trees behind our house. Sometimes he carved little toys for us from scraps of wood from our family shop. I'm sure you know we Jews love to sing and dance and my brother Jesus was no exception. He had a beautiful voice and a special way of clapping his hands and tapping his feet. He and our other brothers often sang psalms together in harmony. My other brother sometimes forgot the words, but Jesus never would. He was the one who led the singing during our Passover Seder celebrations each year. Our relatives and friends used to say Jesus had the most melodious voice they'd ever heard. They said he sang like an angel. They were right. When I close my eyes, I can still hear him singing my favorite song. The Shepherd's Psalm, Psalm 23. I was one of those who watched Jesus ascend to heaven a short while after his cruel crucifixion and amazing resurrection. Watching him disappear into the clouds was a glorious and exciting ending to his time here on earth. 
and the marvelous eternal life promise for all of us who follow him. Yes, Jairus's daughter, Mark, and I, and many others were just ordinary young people transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. You too can experience this transformation and live or die for the glory of God. May it be so in your life as it was in ours. Presenting for us. We we'll start over here. Thank you, Holly, for presenting for us that portrayal of a young disciple, trusting, and even as she grew through the years, young at heart. It's important as we live our lives to keep a sense of readiness and trust to follow as a child, as a young person. And even now, uh, even as we grow older day by day, we can continue to learn from the young. I know that for me and, and for my wife, Joyce Ann, some of those treasured moments right now are those spent with our grandchildren. I know you find that hard to believe. But you might be interested to know this, that some of the most significant times that we're enjoying right now with our grandchildren take place around the family dinner table when we pause for prayer. Now, in my own household growing up, I mean, the prayer was shared between me and my brother, and it was, you know, who could say our rote prayer the fastest and get it over with. Come, Lord Jesus, be our guest. May this be the best. Amen. Okay? Eat. Right? But what impresses me so much about our older grandchildren, the oldest granddaughter and our uh, next grandchild, Mitchell, our first grandson, is that they will offer a version of that prayer, but then they have their own free prayer to offer as well. And so you'll hear in their precious child voices, their prayers offered for grandma, for grandpa, for people who've died, for Doogie, that's their late beagle, for people who are hurt, they pray that people would be nice. They pray for everyone by name. Mommy, Daddy, Maisie, Mitchell, Milo, and sometimes the Nanas and the Papas. They remind all of us as adults at that table what it is to have that simple childlike trust. That's what we see as well in the portrayal of Anne. That simple trust as a sibling, as a sister to Jesus, trusting, loving, not hardened in her heart, not afflicted with age-related cynicism. But by contrast, in this passage from Mark, we encounter the people of Nazareth, Jesus' hometown. It is a truism that familiarity can breed contempt. Sometimes we think we know people too well and we write them off. You know, South Dakota has some 700,000 people, but in many ways here in our state, we experience life as one really big, small town. You know, the connections that go from community to community, families. Diane and I were just visiting about a common connection with somebody that uh, I didn't realize was married uh, through, is related through marriage to a member of her family. So, I mean, 
guarantee you meet somebody from South Dakota, spend enough time talking with one another, you'll find that you know people in common and perhaps even your paths have crossed at some point in the past. So long before there was ever Facebook or other means of social media, if you were going to go out and do something that exposed you to public scrutiny, there's a whole bunch of people that know all about you before you've even said a word, you know? Why, that guy was a real goofball in high school. I can't imagine he's a judge now. <laughs> let those who serve, let those who lead beware, right? We think we know folks. And so we experience what Jesus knew well. And he quotes the understanding that prophets are not without honor except in their hometown and among their own kin and in their own house. So how does that reality play out specifically in the village of Nazareth? Well, as we, we encounter this passage, we need to remember that the cultural backdrop is that of a world governed by the values of honor and shame. Jesus had stepped out of the status and role in society that he would have otherwise had in this village of 1,600 to 2,000 people. As commentators know, our only evidence in the New Testament for Jesus' occupation is the term commonly translated carpenter. Actually, it can be used to describe anyone who works in wood or other hard materials. In that day, people would not have built whole houses out of wood. So as a carpenter, Jesus would have been called upon to produce door frames and other wooden objects and would have done that instead of building complete dwellings. Now, during this particular period of time in their history, Galilee was experiencing prosperity. Jesus and his family were not impoverished tenant farmers or day laborers. But his status as a local craftsman would have been considerably lower than that of a member of the educated class who could devote himself fully to learning the law. And villagers commonly resented those who attempted to elevate their position above that to which they had been entitled by birth. You can hear the murmurings. Who does he think he is? He's a little big for his britches, don't you think? Yeah. Where does Jesus come off saying these things? He's a carpenter. There's also the prospect of continuing rumor, gossip, and scandal. Now, just who was Jesus' father? Probably since the days when they had first moved back to Nazareth, the stories had been circulating. And we hear some of that hinted at in the murmurings of the crowd as they referred to him, well, isn't this the son of Mary rather than the son of Joseph? was probably intended as an insult. And the question, where did this man get all of his wisdom and power, may imply a hostile answer. Well, maybe just perhaps he's the offspring of some other man. Well, we know the truth, the story behind who Jesus' father is. But the people of the village of Nazareth at this point, are not ready to receive that truth. You know, even some of his own family misunderstood Jesus and his mission. As we look through the book of Mark earlier in chapter 3, verse 21, we find that uh, Jesus' mother Mary and some of his brothers went to restrain him because people were saying, this Jesus guy, he's lost his mind. This attempt by Jesus' family to stop his, his wandering and public preaching implies from the perspective of the village that Jesus was thought to be dishonoring his family. And remember, the values governing life are the values of honor and shame. 
And so, in their view, Jesus is bringing shame to his family. Their very limited view. Now, Mark's readers know most likely that members of Jesus' family eventually came to believe in Jesus. We find in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 7, a report that the risen Lord appeared to his brother James. And another brother in the list, Jude, was credited with composing a brief epistle. You know, as we encounter this rejection, as Mark records it, at at Nazareth, many people are surprised by that, though. It's... It's common to think that people who know Jesus best should have been the first to follow him. Yet, if we all stop and think about it, we've all had human experiences of rejection when we've attempted to reach out and help family members who are rebuffed. We've probably been in that place where we might be able to help others solve complicated personal problems, but find great difficulty when it comes to dealing with matters within our own families. The comments attributed to the townspeople remind us of an important fact about Jesus. He was not only fully God, he was fully human. He was a real human being. And he spent much of his adult life at a trade, working with wood. And he didn't overwhelm people as though he were a larger-than-life action hero. If you were to meet Jesus at Levi's dinner or anywhere else, Jesus would probably have come across to us as an ordinary human being. It requires faith to overcome the scandal of the ordinary appearance so that we can recognize that God's healing power comes through him. Friends, for us, the path of following Jesus should lead to growth, to increasing spiritual maturity, but always remembering this, to keep a softness, a tenderness of heart, an unpretentious childlike openness, awe, curiosity, and an attitude of trust toward the Lord. We're called to live as the true siblings of Jesus, living in fulfillment of God's will according to the values and the principles of the kingdom of God. And to do so requires ongoing transformation, or to put it another way, ongoing sanctification, growing in the grace of God. And day by day, we can, we can trust God's grace to be sufficient to each day's journey and to sustain us wherever the journey leads. Friends, as we recall those words shared through the voice of Anne, let us seek that transformation, receive that grace, trusting and remaining young at heart. We pray with me. Gracious and loving God, help us each to take inventory of the condition of our hearts. And where hardness has begun to set in, melt that. Create a soft spot for you to do a new and fresh work in our lives that we might know always what it is to trust you with joy day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.